Chris Wingate, you're coming in from Australia, and Logan Evans, thank you, coming from Southland. Today, all of us, to discuss something called the LAC. Chris, I'm going to begin with you, but before we get into the into the nitty gritty of it, tell us about your background, who you are, and what your connection is to New Zealand. Well, I grew up in Rotorua, and um, I left school at 15. My first job was pulling timber off the um, off the tables at Waipa Sawmill. And then my mother said I had to get a trade. So I got a job at the Geyserland Motor Hotel. I worked for Doug Myers. And um, he inspired me to uh, maybe do something a bit better than just being a chef. So I got a job down in, uh, in Wellington at a couple of his hotels down there. And very quickly, I decided to, uh, to move to Australia. So I came over here when I was about 18. and. Uh, I sort of worked two or three jobs at once. I then started a couple of um, self-employment businesses. The first was market stalls. And then later on, I started the business supplying hotels and restaurants. And then I invested in a whole range of, you know, small businesses. One of them was managing bands and entertainers. Nothing was, uh, you know, particularly successful in that uh, part, but, you know, it was good experience. And then, um, I started supplying hotels and restaurants, and then um, I got into the stock market uh, and, uh, and made quite a lot of money out of that, and then started buying property in different countries, and, um, and then moved back to New Zealand uh, with my darling wife in, uh, was it 19, um, 1989? We had, a, we had a few properties in Rotorua. And um, we thought that was a good place to come and uh, do some breeding. And uh, so we had four magnificent children over there. And then we came back over here uh, to, to Australia in 2004. The pull to New Zealand is strong and somehow you connected with Logan. So, Logan, you, you, you and I are both going to really cross-examine Chris about his idea, the LAC. But what was the first connection of you two? Logan, let's go to you on this. How did you link in with Chris? Uh, look, it was purely through my involvement with Groundswell. Um, we, you know, I seen Chris, this guy, Christopher Wingate, kept putting extremely knowledgeable posts on our Facebook page. And, and I thought, gee, here's a guy that I'd love to talk to. So, um, and this has been something I've probably been good or bad at doing in the last few years is I just flick him a message and say, hey, mate, I love what you're talking about. Um, would you mind if we catch up for a chat? And I don't know, when was that, Chris? Probably, was that like two years ago? Something like that, yeah. And um, so this this man has absolute in-depth knowledge of, of legal systems and stuff that blew my mind. Um, but I'm a... I'm a Southland farmer down here and everything he was talking about, um, I could resonate with. And I knew um, that that what Chris Wingate was on about was something that if the people of New Zealand could hear it um, and understand it, they will demand it. So yeah, I, that, that's why we're here. You write with the real precision of a lawyer, and I've got to say the same, Chris, when I read the material you sent me, it's very exciting. The potential for a system based on truth-telling is very exciting in what you're offering. Before we talk about it, Chris, I'd like to know what you felt about Logan, our wonderful Southland candidate. What, how would you describe this man? Oh, he's real. He's real. Um, I've got relatives who are farmers, and, you know, the great, the great thing about farmers is that they're... Um, you know, they work with their hands, uh, they're out in the fresh air. Um, you know, they're the, they're the backbone of New Zealand. And it, um, you know, it's been tragic watching the way that, um, you know, global policy is trying to uh, destroy farmers. But I think that that's, uh, you know, there are clearly other agendas involved in that. So, um, but, you know, that's another subject. But Logan's a very real is very genuine. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say the mantle of leadership I notice with him just slips very easily onto his shoulders. And surprisingly and wonderfully, we have a number of people who I could say that about in NZ Loyal. 
But let's leave that behind now and talk about this system. And Logan, I want you to come in here and ask the questions that you first asked when you when you started to learn about it. What is, Chris, the LAC? How would you describe it to people who have no idea and have never heard of it? Well, it's the Leadership Accountability Court. Um, we own government, the people own government. And, you know, at every election, we, we vote for a manager to go down there and look after that structure on our behalf. Um, and that's the only form of accountability that we've really got. But we have to go far further than that because, of course, the moment they go down to Wellington, um, they get caught up in this apex structure and um, there's no looking after the people, there's no thinking about what the people need. Um, and as well as that, they become very compliant. You know, accountability in government is compliance, which simply means that there's, you know, there's no thinking for yourself and there's no looking after the interests of uh, a constituent or whatever. Um, and so if they turn around and, you know, it's the party policy that a state-owned asset has to be sold or if there's no uh, no accepting any complaints about what's going on within the judiciary, you know, people uh, attempting to uh, to get justice out of the court system, or alternatively, if there's a complaint about how the Overseas Investment Commission is dealing with issues, there's nowhere to go. You know, the government doesn't have any uh, methodology in which uh, you can actually take a look at the decisions that they're making. And so that's why I came up with the idea of the Leadership Accountability Court. Because, you know, as I would go through um, a variety of horrors over my business career uh, in New Zealand, I, I used to always ask myself, you know, um, how would a jury feel looking at what I'm seeing? And I knew that the jury would agree with me that, um, you know, they don't have permission to do that, but uh, they have the power to do it. So that's why everybody gets... Uh, by government. Interestingly, in the meetings, Logan, you might be finding the same. The biggest thing Kiwis agree with is they have not been listened to by their politicians for decades, decades, and they've felt helpless. Thousands probably of petitions have gone in the last three years, all of them totally ignored. Thousands of letters from people to the politicians, all totally ignored. Why did you call it an apex structure? What do you see it as, what we have now? Chris, just explain that. Well, it's a hierarchy. A lot of people think that the, uh, like, for example, the prime minister is the decision maker, but the decisions are made outside cabinet. You know, our politicians are just puppets. All as they want job. So, you know, they're after the, uh, the prestige of it, the income. Um, and so, you know, they become very compliant to whatever they're told to do. And that's where the danger comes. And that's where about New Zealand's been destroyed over the past 40 years. It's just these compliant politicians. Nobody's prepared to stand up and say, you know, that's bullshit. Um, as soon as somebody stands up and says something like that, then um, their political career is over, isn't it? Well, Logan, that's where we differ, isn't it? So over to you. What, what would your questions be arising from those answers? Yeah, so a common one, Chris, that I, you know, and, and I, I think I asked this at the start, um, but a common question when you float this to a crowd is, but we've already got checks and balances in place. We've, we've got an ombudsman. We've got a governor general. Um, what, why are these systems not working? Well, it's a little bit like a, um, you know, any type of commission of inquiry. Um, they already know the answer they want before they begin. And so when you go to the ombudsman or somebody like that, you know, they've got no power. I mean, I began my complaints over the Matakana Rana litigation in uh, the end of 1999. And uh, within a few years, they had set up the Judicial uh, Complaints Commissioner, but he's not allowed to investigate uh, either the accuracy or the lawfulness of a judicial decision. And that's just one example of, um, you know, these these structures like ombudsman and all that, they're sort of there in name, but they're not there in any form of effectiveness. So that's why we really need a system where about you've got no block in order to get to a uh, to a jury and um, and speak your piece with them. And, uh, you know, as, as they say in Australia, does it pass the pub test? Um, <laughs> you know, 
So meaning, that, meaning what there, Chris? Sorry? Meaning what? The, what is the pub test to your mind? Well, the pub test is kind of like, you know, does that sound like bullshit or not? <laughs> and is it easy to explain and easy to understand? For me, that's that's it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you take a look at the issue that you would be putting before a uh, before a jury, um, you know, you'd be able to uh, snapshot what the issues are uh, basically within a minute. And, you know, they'll hear your complaint. They'll hear what's going wrong. They'll hear that, you know, whoever's in power is, uh, you know, whoever you've got the problem with is... Uh, is, uh, is is failing New Zealand, and so um, then you would look at the evidence. All right, well, let's rewind, take us right through from the ground level. How does it work? Well, can I use Matakana Island as an example? Yeah, would you like to outline briefly what that, what that involved, that complex yeah. space? Yeah, well, like I said, I came back to New Zealand in 1989 and 1991, um, Matakana Island was for sale, it was in receivership, it was 10,000 acres of land covered in uh, Pinus Radiata Forest. And so the first thing that I wanted to know, or first two things, was uh, what's the price? That was 30, 32 plus million. And uh, the other was uh, how much could I sell the forestry for? Because I wanted the 10,000 acres of land to develop into uh, around about 20,000 houses. And so... Um, uh, started negotiating with the Japanese company to uh, buy the 17 to 34 year forest. We got them up to 15.75 million. I went to the debenture holder, Carter Hold Harvey, negotiated directly with Selwyn Cushing uh, for a uh, for a fixed price. He came back at 20 million. So they both sort of, um, uh, you know, came together at about the right time. So I knew that I needed 4.25 million. So I went to a bank to borrow the money. The bank absolutely loved the deal. And within 48 hours, they're working on the deal for themselves, cutting me out. So that's clearly a breach of fiduciary duty, but that sort of skullduggery uh, goes on in New Zealand um, and it's protected. Um, you know, these people, uh, they go to uh, the private schools and um, that particular uh, merchant bank, the uh, one of the partners of the merchant bank was the chief justice's son. Uh, but uh, so I, I, I got into litigation and uh, the barrister said, uh, Eighty to a hundred thousand uh, dollars, less than two years slam dunk. I'd win. Within a year into the litigation, uh, the bank had um, applied to the high court to uh, lift my caveats and uh, sell the land out to Marys, who were claiming it was sacred and subject to a Waitangi claim. And that was my first. Uh, that was my first real experience of a judge just writing a completely fraudulent decision. That was Justice Greg down in the uh, in the High Court in uh, in Wellington, and uh, and the Marys, of course, had no money to be able to fund the transaction, but they were introduced to an American property developer who bought half of uh, the sacred land off them, um, so that gave the Marys uh, five thousand acres plus um, four point six million dollars cash, and um, but they accepted the asset on the basis that they would. Um, um, they would uh, hand the land over to me uh, if I succeeded in my case against the bank. So the trial came around in 1997. It was a four-week trial. They were guilty. Um, we won. And then they applied for a retrial. Uh, we won that. So those decisions then went to the Court of Appeal. And in the Court of Appeal, we lost 4-1. And the decisions against us were completely fraudulent again. It was just a manipulation of the evidence. I mean, that's a really, really serious question. You know, what the hell? It's, it's you know, when, when you're on the receiving end of it, it's like um, you expect to go down to the courthouse and go up to the registrar and say, look, just take a look at this one statement and take a look at that. And, and, and you would expect that, you know, within 15 minutes, you would be sitting with the Chief Justice uh, having a cup of tea and a cookie and he would be apologising profusely. But that isn't how corruption works. You know, corruption works on the basis of just bugger off. Just accept what we're going to give you, and uh, you know we don't care what you've got to say. And, and, and the destruction, of course, financially to my family was just, just, oh, you got no idea. Um, so, uh, so anyway, we had to appeal that decision to the uh, to the Privy Council in London. Um, the uh, the QC over there cost nearly a million dollars for a week. 
we went, we lost, and the decision was written by a New Zealand judge, John Henry. And I found out afterwards from Professor Peter Birx from Oxford University that it was basically a Waitangi decision that the judge had said, you know, we've got this deal that matters of special interest, you know, of national importance, um, you know, the New Zealand judge would go solo on it, and he did. And the judgment that he wrote was just, just absolute pure bloody nonsense. But there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to complain and that's the problem. And, and you know, it's a system um, that we've got in democracy. And this is why it so badly, badly needs uh, modernising, because, you know, we own this structure and we've seen the decimation of it over the last 40 years. And it has to change. It has to change. Some of the things that I've got, I, I've seen going on, and if we had more time, um, there's something that I've been looking at regarding uh, mortgages and, and, and the involvement of BlackRock and, and Vanguard and State Street, et cetera, um, and, and their ownership of our major banks, or the, the larger shareholders in there. You know, I could see a situation of them shorting the market, pulling the money supply. Um, there would be no alternative to people to be able to uh, pay out their mortgages. We would be hit with uh, hyperinflation as our dollar plunges, et cetera, and they would seize control of basically 32% of all the real estate in New Zealand in one hit. And that's the sort of dirt game that they play. You know, and, and I, I, like I said, you know, I, I made dollars in the, uh, in the stock market and, and so I had friends uh, that I made back then. One of them uh, worked for Kerry Packer. Um, so, you know, these guys have a front seat. They know the sort of dirt that goes on. And I know the type of financial instruments that are available in the money market for them to do these types of things. And these sort of things are just just dreadful, just absolutely dreadful. You know, I did a paper just a short while ago. It's called Who Owns New Zealand? Uh, yeah. I, 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 had, I had some people phone me up crying. They were, they were just so horrified at, at what's gone on. So we've got to draw a line in the sand. We've just got to say enough. I mean, we've got to enough. We've, yeah. we've got to. We've got to stop the nation. We've just got to. Oh, look! I'm trying not to swear, but I can tell you that uh, it's bad. Our books are really, really bad. We're we're really at ground zero, I think, Chris. We or, or even into negative territory. But let's say ground zero, where the whole thing is is crumbled to the ground for many Kiwis. The corruption and the ruination of what we want, we thought was a once great societal system. Many Kiwis are fully up for rebuilding from the ground up, which is where you come in with this new system. Can I just ask, you mentioned Justice Greg, which was the bank that did that to you in the beginning? Far Financial and Merchant Bank in Wellington. If I am. That is absolutely, that is absolutely reprehensible. How did you get through that? And and was that where you started dreaming up a system that would counter, counter all of that horror you went through? Is, is that how you dealt with the horror of what you'd gone through in that court case? Well, like I said, uh, you know, I would always ask myself, um, you know, when I would be dealing with these idiots in power, um, what would a jury think? And on the basis, particularly, that the jury, um, you know, by and large, is completely unbiased. They're there to do a job. Um, they're there to look at the evidence and assess it. Um, so they don't come from a political party. Perhaps they've been tapped on the shoulder and promised a, a position as an ambassador or a cabinet or caucus or uh, whatever other, um, you know, entitlement that they get offered. Uh, that corrupts them. You know, the jury are just ordinary New Zealanders. Whereabouts we're going, you know, like I said, does it pass the pub test? Yeah. So that's where the idea came from. And uh, and so over the years, I've been dealing with a, with a whole bunch of, um, you know, law professors, etc. My law, the first law professor that I hired, um, you know, to advise me on fiduciary law and the Matakana litigation was... Um, Professor Paul Finn from Australian National University, and he was the world's expert in the area. Sadly, he died uh, just two days ago. Uh, Professor Rick Bigwood, actually, um, who we both know, um, he contacted me and let me know that he had passed away. But uh, Paul, Paul was amazing. And, um, you know, this whole area of fiduciary law, you know, if you, if, if, if you need to understand it, um, the chaplain of uh, Professor Robert Flanagan from Canada, Canada 
best describes it. He says, the purpose of fiduciary law is to prevent mischief, opportunism, and a limited access relationship. And you see a politician is sitting in this limited access position. He's getting to see special things, things of particular value. And so we, the people, confer power to them with a vote. We confer power to all these people in government who are working for us. It's our tax dollars that are paying for their, uh, their wages. And uh, so the relationship is clearly a fiduciary one, exactly the same as the merchant bank. The moment we pass confidential information to them, then the relationship was fiduciary. And so it's an area of law that, uh, that has fascinated me over the years, but it, it does have its limitations as far as application directly to politicians go. Uh, it doesn't uh, cover negligence, and we have so much negligence in New Zealand. We have non-feasance, malfeasance, misfeasance. You know, and uh, you know, they've got the power to act. Uh, they don't act. And so uh, I thought that we needed something uh, quite different. And so that's where about uh, the advice from... Um, UK barrister uh, Ross Taylor came into it and uh, he actually uh, structured uh, those parts out uh, magnificently and, uh, and we've got what we've got today. We'll talk about that in a moment. For me, fiduciary has all the meaning of I trust you, I give you trust, which is what you and I are asking of the people of New Zealand. We will be trustworthy. We will honour your trust. So, Logan, what then most appealed to you as Chris explained this to take us through some of your questions because I'm really curious about how you unpacked it with Chris before you introduced this idea to me oh look I suppose for me it was just I'd been I'd been working for the last three years um on on wanting the leaders of this country to be accountable for their actions and and that's what me and a, a few of my friends were were trying to achieve but but how how do we do that? We we don't have a mechanism in this country currently to do it. Um, so when I seen you know what Chris was doing, th this is the mechanism that gives the people of this country the opportunity to do exactly that: hold the leaders accountable for their actions. And it's not about turning them into criminals. Um, that's the other thing I like about it. We're, we're not planning to lock these people up at all. We're just saying if you don't do your job, if you do not do the best for the people of this country. Then, then step down, step down from your job and leave us alone and we'll employ someone who will do the job. Um, yeah. I love that. I love that. So take us through how it would work. Chris, tell us, tell us how the building blocks of this get put in place as if, as if neither Logan nor I had ever studied any of this. Explain it to the people of New Zealand watching. Well, obviously we need legislation. So it has to be passed by the politician. And that's where the people of New Zealand basically need to march on Parliament. And if they're in a, you know, in a country town or whatever, we've basically got to stop the nation. We've got to say, no, you work for us. You have to pass this into legislation. Um, the Leadership Accountability Court would be a, um, a, an independent court from the mainstream courts because, quite frankly, they're just completely corrupted. Uh, not all judges. Some of the judges are magnificent. A lot of the staff are magnificent, but um, they simply can't be trusted. And uh, they've certainly proven that with a number of cases that I've seen. A lot of barristers in New Zealand are complaining um, about what's been going on, but I, I won't go into that in detail. But the, the idea of it is that uh, it needs to be basically a, a quick, lightweight court. So um, uh, with my particular complaint, uh, I would need uh, three experts who would agree with me that the uh, the evidence has been manipulated in the um, in the uh, Madagascar Island litigation, and then I would apply online to uh, to the LAC. Um, they can't turn me down. Um, I would get a date uh, with a jury. It would be online, like what we're doing at the moment. Uh, the evidence would be presented to them. And uh, it would be done on an ex parte basis. In other words, it's just between me and the jury. And the purpose of that is that, um, uh, you know, a number of cabinet ministers and prime ministers have told me that, you know, you can't hold politics accountable because they're busy people. And if you've got some accountability mechanism, then they'll be constantly uh, in the courts, uh, you know, tying up their, uh, you know, their valuable time. So, you know, the idea of the ex parte is that you go there and if you can satisfy the jury that 
um, you know, what they're doing is rotten, uh, then you can get an order directly from that court. It would go uh, to the, in my particular case, it would go to the Attorney General and the uh, Chief Justice and it would say, uh, rectify this matter within uh, 30 days to my satisfaction. Or alternatively, if you want to defend the matter, then we'll have a full trial on it. So it gives them that opportunity of, uh, you know, stand back and just take a close look at it. Because I know the system at the moment, I mean, Sir Peter Tapsell, uh, a lifetime friend of mine, pointed out well to me. He used to do this wonderful thing where that's he would, you know, mimic exactly what a politician does whenever they meet you. And he used to pick up a piece of paper and uh, with a pen and he'd be going, you know, with somebody coming in to meet him talking about a problem. And he'd go, my God, that's absolutely dreadful. My God, look, thank you for coming to see me. Yeah, th thank you, bye-bye, and pick up the throw it. Um, and that's that's what goes on in amongst the system. There's nothing genuine. They, they want to give the appearance of genuine, but that's as far as it goes. Um, we've got to be able to trust our politicians, and we've got nowhere that we can go to for truth. Nowhere. I mean, you saw that with the uh, with the COVID event in New Zealand. Um, you know, and, and, and it must be a dreadful position for the politicians to be in because even if they're telling the truth on a matter, people aren't going to believe them because, because the people know that the system's rigged. So that's really why we need the LAC because it becomes this place where about you can go and just test things out and, um, you know, keep, as they say in Australia, keep the bastards honest. <laughs> yeah. So, Chris... Yeah, this is great, Logan. You you go. I was just going to ask. I, I think a question that we will get asked a lot is is what defines those three experts? How you know three experts in the field? What defines that? Well, that's that's something that would be uh, obviously discussed. But um, you know, in my particular case, obviously uh, barristers, law professors, somebody like that. So if you if you're challenging them. Um, you know, for unconscionable uh, conduct or something like that, then um, or a conflict of interest. You know, these are these are legal questions. So if somebody is, um, you know, um, if somebody is, uh, uh, that you know, they have a complaint about failure in amongst um, the mechanisms of government, then uh, they can seek legal advice. Uh, if they can't afford legal advice, then they can get legal aid, um, and. Um, they would simply take a look at the evidence and, um, you know, from their expert position, determine whether or not, uh, you know, something, something's gone wrong. There's actually a precedent for this. Um, about 700 years ago in England, uh, there were people who, uh, like soldiers who would come back from, uh, from Europe and, um, and their houses were sold, their property was sold. And, you know, the uh, the trustee that they had looking after their estate, uh, his brother was suddenly living in their house or something like that. And um, and so the statute of Westminster uh, didn't have anything in that to accommodate that type of wrongdoing because, you know, in essence, they were saying, well, it was written in Latin and the people go, well, I didn't understand Latin. And it's like, well, you know, that's your problem. And uh, so it, it was, in essence, fiduciary abuse. Um but some of these people had connections with the king. And so the king said, um, he got the chancellor to look into their complaints. And um, he, uh, he ordered the setting up of a parallel jurisdiction from the main courts. And it was called the Court of Chancery. And they developed the equitable doctrines of, um, you know, fiduciary law, Anton Pillar order, Marie for order, things like that. Constructive trust, which has moved over to, um, you know, mainstream legislation. So, um, um, you know, that stood alone until 1883 in the, uh, in the Judica Act, which uh, then basically moved the, um, that independent court into the mainstream courts and got caught up with all the rest of that corruption that goes on there, in there. So, um, you know, this isn't, um, uh, you know, this isn't really a brand new concept. It's sort of the resurrection of the Court of Chancery, but sort of modernised and made way more efficient, you know, because the, the purpose of the Court of Chancery was because of the deficiencies that were uh, in the Statute of Westminster. In other words, the law didn't uh, have anywhere for the people to turn to in order to get a resolve out of a problem. 
and so um, you know that's where the LAC comes in and it's uh, in its modern form. It's really fascinating and and could you could you say that you are one of the prime movers prime authors of this or where what inspired you to bring all this together Chris? Pain. You, yeah. But is it is it fully your ideas or is it a number of great minds that have come to this? Well I ha I had a number of great um uh, legal experts in the Matakana litigation. Uh, Paul Finn, first of all, uh, but he became a, uh, uh, a federal uh, court of appeal judge, so um, he could no longer uh, advise me. That was around 1994. Um, then I had Professor Peter Burks from, uh, from Oxford University. Uh, these are tremendous minds. But the problem with Peter Burks was, uh, my complaint to Peter was that he sort of, um, he basically went into the Big Bang Theory, you know, rather than the core concept, the core nucleus of exactly what the purpose of fiduciary law is. You know, he got into a whole lot of areas that sort of made it really confusing. But this guy, uh, Robert Flanagan from Canada, he's nailed it. Anybody wants to take a look at a brilliant legal mind, you get hold of Robert Flanagan and look at his work on fiduciary law. But like I said, fiduciary law does have its limitations. I mean, originally, I used to think to myself that it would be nice just to legislate fiduciary law because it's not available in legislation, only available in equity. And it's, it's remarkable reading the um, case law. You can see the judges. You can see that, oh, shit, we're painting ourselves into a corner. We better not sort of say those words and sort of, you know, keep the sort of, you know, out there. Otherwise, we're going to be accountable to this, uh, this area of law. But, um, you know, it's... Um, it's one of these things that, um, you know, we, we, when you're faced with such an enormous problem, and particularly when you're tackling government, because the resources they've got is just staggering. It's absolutely staggering. I mean, I just sent you a link earlier on of, um, you know, the various agencies that are, uh, you know, looking at me at the moment. Um, Can yeah, you talk is... about that briefly, Chris? That was That was shocking. Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, I've got everybody from Booz Allen, uh, the FBI, Homeland Security, ICE, uh, New Zealand government, um, even the UK Ministry of Defence has sort of popped up on the radar is uh, checking me out. And, um, um, you know, what I'm proposing is is a modernisation of uh, democracy. And that's going to move, that's going to, you know, move the power away from this, uh, you know, these, these hijacked politicians back to the people. So it's a threat to them and it needs to be a threat to them because um, they're, screw they're screwing the public. Everybody's just been had. It's, you know, I, I often refer to uh, really smart people in the money market and these are the guys who play with the multiple billions, you know, hundred, hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, I call them predatory hunters. They're very efficient, very, very efficient at what they're doing. And so, you know, you get a politician, they're like, oh, you know, yeah, we're aware of BlackRock and oh, we had a meeting with them and it's all lovely. It's it's above their pay grade. They've they got no idea. they got no idea of the, uh, the level of sophistication that these guys are coming in there. And particularly when, it, when you wrap it up with money supply. I mean, that's something that uh, really attracted me to, uh, to you know, to, to what you had to say. It's just remarkable to hear somebody stand for public office saying, this is what's going on. To be perfectly frank, I'm surprised you're still alive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty determined, Chris. And there's, I think there's a higher hand blessing something over this country. New Zealand's meant to show the world a way back. And your ideas could be a seminal part of that. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating when you think in politics, you're meant to have other branches of government that keep an eye on the politicians, such as the judicial arm of government or the, the fourth estate, the press. And that's completely collapsed. So yeah. now what you're proposing is, in fact, the reintroduction of of a much fairer system, you called it lightweight and you meant that it's much easier and cheaper for people to access, didn't you? It's not going to take months of time to get into court. It's not going to cost thousands of dollars to take this. Am I right there? Exactly. It's got to be that way. It's got to be quick and fast. You know, it's like, um, 
you know, there's a, there's a wonderful saying, I don't care if you think I'm an idiot, just answer my question. Yes. <laughs> so, and that, it's kind of like that with, uh, you know, politicians or bureaucrats. Um, I just want you to answer the question and answer it fully. So, you know, you, you just said something interesting before um, regarding um, uh, three hands on the power. You know, the purpose of uh, separation of power is so that you've got these three individual branches um, of decision making. You've got the executive, which is the cabinet. You've got the legislator, which is the House of Representatives. And then you've got the judiciary. Um, and so the purpose of se the separation, the very purpose of separation is so that if one hand is up to mischief, then another independent hand can then step in. But of course, when it came to uh, the manipulation of the evidence in the Matakana litigation, when I complained directly to uh, the Attorney General, Minister of Justice, uh, Prime Minister, etc., they turned around and said, we can't interfere because of the independent judiciary. I said, well, the purpose of the, you know, the independent, um, uh, sorry, the purpose of separation is for this very purpose. And, and, and that's where they won't engage. That's where best they just shut you down. And th that is the very edge of the problem. That's the very edge of the problem. Yeah. So, Chris, um, I, I have well, one point for me that when I read through your plans, that was, um, I suppose for me, it was, the, it was the kicker that made me think, well, hey, this system is, is perhaps uncorruptible. Um, the fact that the judge that presides over the case is, is only sitting there to, to make sure everything runs as it should and, and he is bound by exactly the same accountability as, as others. Is that, is that, have I got that correct? Yeah, like, for example, in the Matakana litigation, if I had that before the LAC, uh, the judge can't turn around and say, well, I know that judge, he's got a lot of credibility and, you know, this just can't be right or whatever, trying to sort of, you know, twist the jury or, or attempting to uh, cut off certain evidence. You know, the, the jury will decide what evidence they're going to have a look at to see whether or not uh, mischief has gone on. And that's what we need because the system at the moment, you know, when I say that the system's rigged, it's completely, utterly rigged. It it's is. Com completely rigged. Anybody who thinks that uh, the judicial system is rigged, actually going to get justice, they're completely wrong. I used to have this uh, sort of hypothetical exercise of, you know, wouldn't it be good to, uh, you know, go to one of the major law firms in New Zealand and, and, and just run an exercise, a piece of paper that says, um, that you've loaned $10 million to somebody and they've gone in default and another piece of paper, a loan agreement, which is for $10,000. And, and you have two independent people go to the same law firm. I mean, the $10,000 one will turn, you know, trying to run that through the courts, that'll turn into about a $15,000, $25,000 bill. Um, and the uh, $10 million one will turn into uh, a three or four or $5 million bill, even though the, the argument is exactly the same. And this is the thing, you know, the, the slower the justice, the more the, in, the, more the income. Um, you know, like I said, we began our litigation on the basis of eighty to $100,000, less than two years slam dunk. You know, by the time I walked out of the high court, we'd been through three and a half million dollars. It's another million dollars for the court of appeal and a million dollars for the Privy Council. Um, yeah, just dreadful. Just I remember when I, when I left law, Chris, thinking, oh, law isn't really about justice. It's about who can pay for justice. <laughs> and I went into media thinking media is about truth. And when I left media, I thought, oh, media may not be about truth. It's about who can pay for truth. And I was totally disillusioned with both. Well, yeah. Six, yes. Six corporations own media throughout the world. You know, they've always, you, anybody interested, just start Googling the history of media and the interference by uh, government, et cetera. You can see all, you know, e even some of the early publications that were set up by the, uh, by the unions, they were prosecuted by government until they were broke. Um, and it, it's happening right throughout the world. It's happening right throughout the world. And the level of corruption by God, the, the, the Good Law uh, Project over in England, it's run by New Zealand uh, QC or KC now. Um, he, um, you know, he got so sick and tired of all the, um, the kickbacks and, and you know, the donations to the political parties in exchange for these, um, you know, uh, PPE 
COVID contracts over in England, and these contracts are worth billions of dollars. Um, and 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 the hell that he's gone through in the courts, just over. It's obvious what's going on. The conflicts of interest are so obvious, and 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 the lack of cooperation from the cabinet ministers, etc. And that what, same sort. Of what's his on. name, Chris? What's his name? This Kiwi. I, I can't remember his name, but it's the Good Law Project. I'll send it to you afterwards. He's a remarkable guy. And I'd also like I'd also like that article you referred to earlier about who owns New Zealand that is making people cry. People are weeping. I was in a meeting yesterday, an 87-year-old man took me aside. He was weeping for New Zealand. That breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. So let's get back to this jury idea. Could we not have our peers? Do we have to have people who are legal experts for the for the three? Or can they just be ordinary Kiwis listening to or, ordinary Kiwis? What do you think of that, Chris? Well, again, I, 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 you know, I don't think that decision is really mine. Um, you know, like any of these types of things, uh, you know, there are there are experts who would look at it, um, you know, to consider it. But um, the most important thing is that uh, it's got to be kept lightweight and easy access. Uh, so, um, you know, whatever the obstacles are, uh, as long as the mission statement, the mission objective would stay the same, that the public had delivered a system where perhaps they can hold politicians and bureaucrats and judges, um, you know, to account. Uh, as long as we maintain that focus, then uh, we should be right. Yeah, so far as, you know, who the experts are and, and what exactly qualifies them as an expert, well, you know, um, at the end of the day, if something snuck through that shouldn't sneak through and it, it the jury would soon see that. How does it fit with the current legal system we have? Does it go side by side? Is it an alternative? Is it a replacement in your view? Well, it's a little bit like the uh, Court of Chancery, isn't it? It's, um, you know, you've got the mainstream courts dealing with legislation um, and you had the Court of Chancery uh, dealing with uh, the conduct of people in positions of power because that's exactly what the... Um, what the Court of Chancery was doing. That's, that, that was the development of the equitable jurisdiction. So, um, you know, it's all about the conduct of the people in positions of power. You know, you confer power to them and you confer power to them so that they have the discretion, they have the independent ability to be able to make a decision on your behalf. And this is what we have at the moment, you know. So it's like, well, you know, people talk about the independent judiciary. It's so important. It's very important in democracy. I can tell you right now that you know, um, if I was a um, if I was a dirty rat in business, uh, you know, in the multi billion dollar business, I would be looking at how can I corrupt the judiciary, how can I manipulate it? And of course, the judges are lawyers; they come from major law firms, and these major law firms, uh, you know, they they bill out uh, you know hundreds of billions of dollars a year to corporations, so we know where their loyalty is. You how, know, do, the, how, do, how do you stop the corruption coming into the new system? How do you feel it's protected? Well, it's protected because you've got the jury. The judge can't do anything. He can't manipulate it. And so I you've, suppose, yeah, I suppose with the jury, they're so different every time. It's not as if it's not as if people have a heads up ahead of time. We can just go for those three because they're changing constantly. Is yeah, that exactly. Right? exactly. And if the, if the you know the, the jury would have to explain and everything's recorded. It, it's very much like an open discussion. So everybody would have to explain their position. So, you know, if there were corruption, like, for example, if it was the Matakana Island thing, you know, if there was a, a you know, a Maori chap on there and he turns around and goes, well, you know, um, you know, you're just a white capitalist pig and you shouldn't uh, be buying that type of land, even though it's been in private ownership, it's never been stolen. It was bought off Maori legitimately, uh, you know, back in the 1880s uh, for good cash, um, and it's been private ever since. But um, well, and, until the uh, judge handed it to, to the Mary. But um, if you had somebody like that, then you'd be able to pick that up. And if you if you ended up with an adverse decision, you again would be able to go to the LAC and say, well, you know, here's a, a breach of my rights. Now, I just wanted to mention one other thing about the Madagascar litigation. Anybody out there who's from Taronga? You, you know, if you ask them who owns Matakana Island, I can tell you what the answer is. They say we do. And even Mary say this. 
they say we own it. If you actually check the title, it's not. Um, you know, during the litigation, I used to say to them, uh, you know, who owns Matakana? They would say we do. And I'd say, who's we? They'd say, Naitarangi Iwi. And then I would say, well, how come on the title there's a company called Tiko Tukutuku? Oh, yeah, that's our company. And I'm like, well, how come the shareholders of the chairman of your tribe, the chairman of the Taranga Moani, Mana, Moana Iwi Trust Board, uh, the chairman of the Matakana Island Charitable Trust, uh, your chartered accountant, how come they're the shareholders? And of course, you know, a number of years after the Privy Council decision was over, they turned around and cashed out, walked away with, you know, over $100 million. And the ordinary people of the year, we got nothing. And this is the typical thing that's going down in New Zealand at the moment, is that you've got this almost sponsorship or, um, you know, turning a blind eye by the people in the system because they want the Maori elite. You know, they want to be able to march in a Maori, a well-cashed-up Maori who's going to agree with them. And um, um, it, 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 it's just appalling for the ordinary Maori. Like I said, I grew up in Rotorua and, you know, Whenever I'm back there and visiting, I, you know, I look in their refrigerators and look in their cupboards. They're suffering. They're suffering really, really bad. Very you know. much. We've got a candidate, a wonderful woman, Janita Andrews up in Whangare, and she is saying none of that money is, just as with Europeans, none of that money from the elite, they call them, I call them parasites, the parasitic 1%, none of that money is filtering to the people. It is, you know, so you have the corporate iwi and then you have the real uh, Māori who are in the hapu, and they are not benefiting at all. For the hierarchy, um, uh, you know, in, in amongst the Māori hierarchy, you've got, um, you've just got self-interest action. And again, that's, a, a, you know, a complete breach of fiduciary duty. But nobody's enforcing any of these laws. There's no government agency who's saying enough. So uh, again, the, the LAC could be used by, by all of us in, in that way as well. So, Every one of us. When you come when you come up, up against red tape, I had a property in Rotorua called um, well, it was called Rose Cottage when I owned it. It was actually the uh, Wilson and Wilson family, Wilson and Horton. Uh, it's a one acre property on the lakefront, um, and uh, what's it called now? Black Swan Lodge. It's a luxury lodge, and um, um, the uh, the council turned around and said that I had to build a fence around the swimming pool, and I said, well. You know, I've got 100 metres of waterfront with the jetty and all that. Do you want me to fence that as well? It was, no, just just your swimming pool. And I pointed out, well, I, you know, I sort of took it naively. I said, well, you know, we don't have any children uh, as yet. I bought that property when I was 25. Um, and, uh, you know, I tried to deal with the council over it, but no, it was like, you know, you have to build a fence around it. And so there's, there's no logic. So that type of thing could be tested. I've got friends over here with waterfront properties with swimming pools right down at the edge of the water, and they also have to have a fence around it, separating the pool and the water. You know, the, it's, it's just ridiculous. It, there's just so much of the stupidity, but there's nothing you can do about it. It'd be great if you can drag them in to the LAC. I mean, it, it, it'd make prime time TV, wouldn't it, if they're going to defend such a case after you've gone through the ex parte. Uh, and, uh, you know, succeeded in your case and the uh, order has gone through to the uh, the politician or the bureaucrat that they have to uh, rectify the problem. And if they turn around arrogantly that they're going to defend the matter using taxpayer money, of course, as they always do, um, and then the jury can actually listen to them uh, and the public would be able to tune in and listen to their answers. Like the co the whole COVID event, I mean, some of those some of those answers. I think people would be actually shocked. I think they know that they can smell a rat. There's something really, really dirty going on there. Um, but um, I think pe people want to see these people answer. They talk about answer time in Parliament and all that. That's all rigged. It's all bullshit. Waste of time. So what's interesting is it's not weighed down by precedent. You're not having a representative do it. You you present yourself. It's a very common sense solution isn't it Chris? Absolutely well you can have a lawyer act on your behalf and like I said if you can't afford one then um, you know you could uh, you could get legal aid for that um, but uh, I mean uh, with the Matakana Island litigation uh, I know the facts uh, and the law better than uh, most so um, I would uh, I'd represent myself in that matter. That Logan what are, the, what are the practical 
aspects really appeal to your wonderful practical farmer's nature about Chris's idea? Oh, well, there's just there's so many there's so many aspects of of New Zealand life in the last three years that this can be applied to. Uh, you know, we've had leaders in our agriculture sector who have not worked in the best interest of New Zealand farmers, and and that's the one that's appealed to me because I have sat there at meetings and and called these guys out on it, and they just call you a conspiracy theorist and carry on doing what they're doing. And yeah. Uh, j just putting the power back with the people it, it is that simple and um that's that's what nz law is about we we're going to listen to the people we're going to put the power back with the people and and this absolutely fits our mantra our ethos it's right we want to be in isn't it on that note logan could you mention that story of the fellow who's meant to be marketing our meat overseas and in fact talk to everybody just tell that story in, in case people didn't hear that clip from one of our meetings uh, yeah, um, so we've got people from the, the World Economic Forum that have now infiltrated right into our government systems here in New Zealand. Um, and I was at a at a producer day the other day and we had a, a man by the name of Vangelis Vitalis uh, speaking to the group. Uh, it was also on the, on the you know, the, the little form with the resume, his resume, um, that he sits up within four boards on the World Economic Forum. Um, so the, this is one of the lead trade negotiators for the New Zealand agriculture sector. And that to me is, is extremely scary um, that these guys are in the positions they are. So yeah, once again, leadership accountability law, I, I, I presume it could be used in that instance. And he came into a meeting and said, what, Logan? It was just devastating. Oh. Believe it. What did he say? Uh, yeah, his lead line was, I'm not. I'm not going to apologise for what I'm about to say. The golden age of red meat production in New Zealand is over and the next eight to ten years are going to be pretty hard going. These are to farmers who are absolutely broken by the regulations, absolutely stretched by the poor economic management of our country. And we are going to turn this right around, Chris. We're lifting all the regulations off our farmers that are not. There are yep. thousands of them. Yep. If, if I can say, you see, it's these types of, you know, Marxist policies hmm. that are actually designed to economically, uh, you know, socially economically destroy us. You can see it right board education, sale of state-owned assets, little silly things like, for example, the uh, supermarkets able to buy land and then caveat to block uh, competition. I did, I did some numbers yesterday on potatoes. Because I, I was talking to a uh, to a former tenant of mine uh, in New Zealand who was telling me that um, potatoes at the local supermarket were fourteen dollars a kilo, and it was just it was just breathtaking. So um, I took a look at it, and it was uh, uh, two and a half acres or one hectare produces um, uh, ninety ton of uh, of potato, and so um, you know. If you take a look at, um, if you you know, if you take a look at the farmer even getting say uh, you know five dollars a kilo, um, that would be uh, four hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, you know, for that one hectare. But of course, they're not getting that. You know, the supermarkets are just screwing, and they they do a lot of tricks like uh, transfer pricing. You know, that's why you look at all of the major corporations, and they've got some um, tax haven uh, companies. It's it's just it's just dreadful, and 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 the thing is that there's, you know, the money makes sure that the lobbyists uh, make sure that the law is in their favour all the time. Yes, that's where that's where we've got no chance. And so this policy regarding, um, you know, the destruction of uh, of meat production out of New Zealand. I mean, that's worth a lot of export dollars to us. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's all of this destruction uh, of our economy, which totally fits that, uh, you know, zero day, um, you know, horror hypothetical of mine that um, they'll pull the money, they'll short the, they'll short the market, they'll pull the money, supply, we'll get hyperinflation, and we won't have any products in order to export. All of our forestry is basically offshore owned now. 
it's it you know and, and what have we got we've got 700 and you know the last numbers that have come out are what 722 billion dollars gross net debt that's government the banks and so on and so on we've got what 360 billion dollars in mortgages alone so if you take a look at a rise of just the four percent that we've seen in the last uh, year or so um you know um i did the numbers on that i think that's 14 billion dollars a year going to the banks oh, and that's getting sucked from the community yep it, it, there's it pe people are suffering this is why i this is the this is why I just get really annoyed. It's like we've just got to stop the country. We've just got to go. We've just got to go to our. We've just got to figure out what week and whoever's going to take the lead on, whether it comes after the election or what. No, but we've just got to stop the country. We've got to say no. Enough. Enough. Well, Chris, I mean, as as leader of New Zealand Oil and having talked it through with Logan, we have not yet taken this to all our candidates, but this is a very important policy that Logan and I agree on, and. And absolutely, a New Zealand law of governance would adopt this. So if people want this, they can support us because we'll be brave on this and many other areas. I'm just I'm just wanting to rewind to what Logan said. So you see this man who's meant to be marketing our farmers' red meat overseas, who's got a very clear bias, who's telling information to our farmers that's breaking their confidence. Where do we where do we go to with that? Does somebody take that man to the LAC and say, what are you doing in the execution of your duties towards the farmers? You know, one of the first things that I would be doing is asking how the hell he got the job. Why did they select him? Exactly. He's obviously selling the narrative that they want. And that's like I said, any of these royal commissions, inquiry, most of the judicial decisions, the decision is worked out out the back in advance. You know, they know the they know the path, they know the decision, they know the outcome that they want. And that's what the predatory hunters in business want. They want to know for certainty. So Peter Tapsell had a great saying, the great thing about corruption is you get certainty. I read a definition of tyranny that it's not actually from the top down crushing, that's part of it. But tyranny at the top, tyrants at the top give permission to those within society to rip each other off if they have that sort of bent and this is what tyrants in New Zealand have enabled this is what this government has encouraged in those who are willing to oppress others there's been free reign under Labour free reign. Peter Tapsell said an interesting thing and, and at a luncheon with David Longy David confirmed it as well and I couldn't believe it when I heard it he said the most Peter said the most corrupt agency in government is the Department of Statistics and I was like what it was, you know, but you, anybody here, go onto the Department of Statistics and try and find out how much debt. Try, try and find some numbers. You yeah, have a look. It's all manipulated. It's all hidden and, uh, you know, because, because they don't want people to know the numbers. Like I said, as far as the gross net debt go of $722 billion, you know, th those numbers are from a few years back. And um, you can't find the current numbers. They hide it all. They constantly hide it. It reminds me of Enron. You remember the collapse of Enron? They hid all their uh, bad debt under other structures at full value. So they had a subsidiary that was worth, you know, $3 billion parked in the Bahamas. But it was, a, you know, that was the original value of it before that $3 billion were lost. And this is the sort of antics that goes on in New Zealand. When people really get to see what's going on, they're going to be horrified. They're going to be absolutely bloody horrified. But the great thing about it, or what, well, great thing about it there's not much good in amongst it but you know one of the things that uh, I've certainly had my eye on is an area of law known as the illegal contracts act so if you've if, so if you've got lobbyists and you've got big money that's going into political parties you know to interfere with that independent fiduciary politician that's supposed to be acting on our behalf then any legislative favors that he made in favor of their corporation you can reverse those transactions on the basis that they're illegal of no effect. Exactly what I'm I'm saying in our meeting slogan. Are you saying that as well? People are saying, how will we get rid of a contract with BlackRock that Jacinda signed up to and never told the people of New Zealand about? And I say, she walked out of there and never talked about it with us. She's meant to be our representative. She's signed up to something that none of us knew about. So it cannot be a legal contract. It cannot be legal because so we didn't know about it. So mm. far, her pay grade. No. Got no idea. No idea. 
This is really exciting, Logan. I know you have to go. I think, Chris, we need a follow-up. Logan, what would your feeling be? I think this is long enough for today, but we could encourage people who are interested to send in questions in the thread under this under this um, post. And then I think we'll do a part two or even a part three with you, Chris, answering some of the questions that will come in about how the introduction of this LAC system might look under a New Zealand loyal governance. What do you say, Logan? Yep, no, I think that's a great idea. I think we should, um, like a lot of this stuff gets pretty deep and, you know, for me sitting here listening to to the level of corruption that that's out there, um, it's it's pretty scary. So I think we should finish on on you know on the bright side. Um, but on the bright side, um, if we can implement this thing, um, you know, it's going to give New Zealand such a bright future. Uh, we we don't, you know, we need to be thinking of a hundred years time. What 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 sort of country are we leaving for our children? And and this policy and, and Chris Wingate's plan is something that. You know, even though I don't understand all the detail that he does, um, I can sit there and go, yes, this is something I want for my children's future. What a wonderful way to end. Chris, I don't think you and I can top that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Logan. Please post your, your questions about it underneath this video and Logan and I will study them and then we'll take these back for part two with Chris. Thank you all. Thanks so much.